Testing. Okay. All right. I think we are ready to start. Um, okay. So the first thing that I will do is um, I. So there's three Tuesdays: the seventh, the fourteenth, and the twenty-first in December. Um, that will meet, and then that last week of December we won't. The week between. Christmas and New Year's, um, we won't. Uh, so I do have a food sign up. I put three lines since there's a lot of us if you want to be three. Maybe fill in the first two first. If you've done it a lot already and you want to break, feel free to pass it on. And you guys have been great about signing up and bringing food and um, all kinds of things. And I hope you have enjoyed that. So um, I can start it. Oh, I'll start it back in the corner here and we'll just pass it along. But if you've signed up before a bunch of times, like I said, don't feel like you have to right away because I know there's some people who have said that they would sign up. Um, it's just full by the time it gets there. So that's okay. Um, and it, just as a note too, if you're new and I don't have your email address, like if you didn't get the email that said there's new notes posted, um, then let me know. Um, I do have an extra sheet because um, I can make sure that you get added to the group. It comes from Flocknote because it's just easier to, then I can send it once and then it does its magic and sends it out to everyone. And it also saves them. So I think you can go back in and look at it if you want to and see. But usually I try to add in, like you've probably seen, I added in a link to the playlist where all the Bible studies are. So if you want, you can always bookmark that. Bookmarks are usually like the star on the top, like address bar thing of a web browser. If you hit the star, when you click on that link, it'll probably bookmark the playlist and they just, they all appear there. I add them to it. And it's the same thing with the Google document. Um, I don't mind sending it out. That part's easy enough, but it's just there to help you. Because I know that there's other people who watch it or maybe you have friends or you're going to be gone because you're abandoning us to the throes of winter and <laughs> you're going to roast in the sunshine somewhere further south. Um, and do remember that I know this is going to seem crazy, but you can always go back and look at the questions after we talk about things too. And if you really want to do something crazy and outstanding, you could invite people over to your house and talk about questions. Because um, some of you, I think, are actually starting to enjoy it, even though you think my questions are hard. Um, so today, one of the things, we're starting this um, discourse and this Bread of Life discourse. And I, I kind of don't care for the book's commentary quite as much as I thought I would because it feels kind of dry and boring. I, it may have felt kind of dry and boring to you. But I think there's some different things at work that we want to be aware of. The first one that I would recommend is be careful about jumping too quickly to the Eucharist. It's, in a sense, it's like, oh, it's John chapter 6. We want to think about the Eucharist. It is about the Eucharist. We don't want to deny that. But it actually doesn't start there. It starts with something spiritual. And it's a very layered conversation. Um, it begins with believing in Jesus, and then it transitions to chewing on the words of scripture, and then it does ultimately transition to the Eucharist and eating the flesh and blood of Jesus. But we have to be careful that we don't jump too quickly, because otherwise I think you can miss a lot of what is being said and the images that are linked together. For instance, in the first part of the discourse, it's very concrete that Jesus is talking about reading the scriptures, for instance. And that reading the scriptures is to encounter and to do the will of God, that it's to encounter him, that it's to consume his body. Um, the image is a little bit different, but it's there. And we have to be careful that there's like this Catholic thing, like Catholic credibility. You know, you have to show your stuff because it's John 6 and Eucharist. And yes, we want to get there. The end of the discourse does. But be careful about jumping too quickly because you want to see the layers. Jesus is pulling some things together. 
And one of the biggest pieces is a rereading of a certain story. What is the story that's in the background, the history that Jesus is relating to? Manna in, Manna in the desert. So this is the time of Moses and the Israelites at Mount Sinai. And the manna is kind of like after they leave the desert or after they leave Mount Sinai and they're on their way toward the Holy Land. And when they're out in the desert, what do the people start doing? Grumbling. Grumbling. That is one word, but there's an even better word that shows up in this chapter again. Murmuring. They're murmuring against um, Moses in the Old Testament. And here, they're go it's going to use the same word in their opposition to Jesus. And so, when you're starting to wonder how they're approaching things, for instance, the context that the scripture is giving you is the murmuring in the desert. So if you're like, huh, I wonder what they're doing. Where should you look? Where should you look? You can paint with a broader brush if you want. It's back in the Old Testament. This one isn't in the book of Exodus. You have to move past Exodus and Leviticus and get to the book of Numbers. <laughs> the murmuring in the desert is found in the book of Numbers. Um, Deuteronomy gets to a point where most of Deuteronomy is speeches given by Moses about the covenant and about what has happened and a sort of retelling of the history. But the history itself, I'm pretty sure, is found in the book of Numbers, amidst lots of other really long lists of names. One thing that I have decided in my life, um, I've read through the entire Bible several times. When I do it again, I'm skipping the lists of names. Do you ever get to those like 6,955 people from this family and 2,600 and then you add them all up and it's this many like, yep, yeah, great. I don't know how this is part of salvation. I'm really struggling, Lord. But it's in there. I'm just going to skip those. They're not, uh, they don't seem to have quite the same weight for salvation as uh, lots of the other passages. Um, okay. So the people are looking for signs and works. They're having difficulty believing. But we've talked before, a huge piece of this chapter is actually about the nature of faith. What does faith mean? And it's a really weird question for us to ask because, in a sense, we're on the inside and approaching it from the question of like, well, I have faith, I wonder what it means. But there's this division line between those who believe in Jesus and those who don't between those who have decided to surrender and trust in him and that there's this, con there's this relationship, there's this connection, and those that don't. And you don't see this as clearly, or at least I didn't see it as clearly until you start meeting people on the other side who really don't believe, because the same event happens. In this case, Jesus feeds 5,000 people, right? For those who have faith, you look at it as this sign and this miracle of God's grace. If you don't approach it from faith, what do you see? Cook with a lot of food. You see someone, some, this huge amount of food came from somewhere, but we don't know where it's from. Mm -hmm. It just appeared, we can't explain it. Maybe that's where we have to leave it. But you see, there's this profound difference between faith and not faith. And especially if you've grown up in a church your whole life and you've been faithful your whole life, I think it's hard to sort of leave the mentality behind and like, oh, yeah, it's different. Like even the resurrection from the dead. Ignatius Press put out a book called The Rising, which is a fun story. It's a novel. And it tells the story of this child who receives the power to raise people from the dead. And it's a rather fascinating story because I think the book knocks it out of the park and it's uncomfortable, right? Because if you're a person of faith and you see someone rise from the dead, what does it mean? You see it as a work of grace, it's a miracle, it's a sign of the love of God, it's something to say thank you for. If you see someone rise from the dead and you're not approaching it from faith, what do you do? 
you might be afraid or you ask a question. Were they really dead? They weren't really dead, they just looked like it. And the book wrestles with that question and it shows kind of clearly how this line divides. But Jesus says the same thing. He, this is really odd, right? There's this story about um, this parable that he tells about the rich man and Lazarus and the rich man ends up in hell and you know he says, go back to my brothers and tell them. What does Jesus say? If they don't believe in the scriptures, they will not believe if someone should rise from the dead. Think about that. We would say the opposite. You see someone rise from the dead and it's like, okay, there's no way that's possible. Like, this is a sign of the grace of God. But we're approaching it from the inside, from this perspective of faith. And when you have the perspective of not faith, you're in a different spot. And Jesus comments on that. If you refuse to believe the scriptures, you will not believe someone who rises from the dead. In the story of the resurrection of Jesus, what do the Pharisees do? After Jesus rises from the dead. They bribe the guard to say that someone came and took him in the night. They refuse to believe, even though he's risen. And you see it happen, and it's like, huh, Jesus told us about this. But you, we have to try and be clear about it. Does that make sense? Because faith, it's, it's actually the strange thing. It's like, it's really hard to define, and it's hard to say how it works. But it's, it's this kind of weird thing, because it's a dividing line. Once you have it, you're in a different spot than when you don't. And it it's, can be a challenge of... Um, it can be a challenge of, that you guys deal with in your family life, too, for instance. Like, you might have children who no longer practice, and it's like, well, what's going on? And you talk to them, and it's like pulling teeth from a screaming two-year-old because they just won't jump in, right? But sometimes it's that they're no, there's no longer faith, and that's the dividing line. So that's at work in this story. You, we will see it. So Moses is in the Old Testament. Now, the people make an error here that Jesus calls them out on. What do they say about Moses and the manna in the Old Testament? They say, Moses gave us bread. Is that true? Who gave them bread? So remember that when you encounter these things in the Bible too, people say things. Stop and ask, is this actually true? Because sometimes it's not. Sometimes it's missed a little bit. Good old mystery novels. If you like Agatha Christie, Miss Marple always asks this question, and she is a wonderful guide for life. <laughs> she talks about how people are always getting in trouble because they believe what other people tell them and forget to ask, is it true? So here, Mo the people have a kind of wonky idea about Moses. And so what happens? They've put Moses in a place that Moses doesn't belong. And they've taken God out of it. Th so there's a problem at the heart of their understanding of this story in the Old Testament. But he is also the prophet who saw God face to face. Moses is a great figure. He's the first one. He would glow with radiance. He had to wear these veils all the time because he scared the people. And then Jesus says, my Father. Jesus is changing the dynamic of the entire story. And this is something as Christians too that we have to be a little bit careful of. Um, that when you're in the Old Testament, getting to Jesus is kind of complicated. Like you can do it, Jesus is there. But what you have to know is that Christianity took a certain reading of lots of different passages that in and of themselves are more ambiguous than we give them credit for. Like the most famous one of all, the virgin birth of Jesus. I think it's from Isaiah 7. The virgin will conceive and bear a son, and you shall name him Emmanuel. You know, Jewish people had that prophecy for several hundred years, and they didn't immediately say, oh, this is about the Messiah. Like Christians do, and we immediately look at it as, oh, that's about Jesus. But it, 
doesn't necessarily follow. So we have to be careful because it's not that Christianity is wrong. It's just that we have a certain reading of lots of events in the Old Testament. And at the heart of it is this reinterpretation given by Jesus. Jesus is the fork in the road for Christians. And here is one of the biggest pieces because he says, My Father is the one who gave you the true bread from heaven. He reset the entire story. Not God, not Moses, not someone foreign, not someone far away, but my Father. You stand in a relationship. And we talked about how in John chapter 4, one of the keys to Christian worship of God is this new relationship that we stand in because we're brothers and sisters in Christ. So that's another little important nugget that is good to pull out. And here too, in this discourse, you have believing in Jesus through faith, which is the way most Protestants read the discourse. And Catholics want to say, no, it's about the Eucharist, right? And actually, we're both wrong, because it's not either one. The discourse very clearly has these two layers. At first, Jesus is talking about believing in him, and then he'll talk about the Eucharist. And then there's this history in the background of Moses and Mount Sinai and the manna. And they're actually both true. That's another good trap to remember to avoid, is that Scripture can be true in lots of different directions, in lots of different ways. And we want it to be, we want to try and read it as it is. And so just because it means one thing doesn't mean it doesn't mean another one. It's oftentimes both. And if you remember that and you get to end times prophecy, you will save yourself all kinds of gray hair. Because you can throw most of the baloney out the window because it's like, well, this is what this passage means. How do you know? Well, it says that. Yeah. And people a thousand years ago thought that that passage was talking to them. Are they wrong? You know, people in another thousand years might think this passage speaks to them and speaks to their time in history. Are they wrong? And the answer is, no, it can be true more than once. It's like God cheated. <laughs> One of the things that is also a part of the story is that the manna disappears. This is something I didn't pick up on before. How long does the manna last? Just a day. Just a day. It dis like it, the actual story is that it melts in the sun. And the more you read about manna, the more it's really like, what on earth was this stuff? <laughs> Like it comes in the morning and it melts in the sun. And you get twice as much on Friday so that you don't have to gather any on Saturday. And that day it lasts for two days. But otherwise it only lasts for one day. Like what is it? It's a good question. We don't know. But this is interesting because this is something that Jesus uses. So the manna disappears and you constantly have to get new manna. What does he say about the bread of life? That it's eternal, that it's unchanging, that it doesn't disappear, that it lasts forever. And so again, it's like the details of the story of the manna are actually what shows up in the discourse. You can map them almost one to one. They correlate. That's important. Because another piece of this is going to be extremely important, and that is the Paschal lamb, Passover lamb. Remember Passover lamb. Okay, so then Jesus says, I am the bread of life. And you should be used to this by now. He says, I am the bread of life. And remember, we have to break our English brains. What did he actually say? We've talked about these I am statements before. Do you remember where they come from? The burning bush. The, burning bush, the God of Israel. The God of the covenant. So he doesn't really say, I am the bread of life, like we think of it in English as a basic phrase. He would say, or more properly, you might say, the God of the covenant is the bread of life. The God of revelation, the God who is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit is the bread of life. That's what I am means. And for the life of me, I cannot figure out why translations get so blind about this. They should at least footnote it and say, hey, you should know this because any Jew who knew Greek, which is what the New Testament was written in and what it was preached in, most likely, would make that connection almost automatically. 
because you would hear echo the exact same words. And in English, sometimes it's not there. So I am the bread of life. It uses the divine name. But the bread of life, this is a title to think about because the bread of life would first, the first image that comes to mind for us is, what's the first image that comes to mind for you? The bread of life is the Eucharist. Yeah. But the bread of life, this is why I ask the question, what does it mean to live? You could almost say that this is a theme in the Gospel of John. What is life? What does it mean to live? Because the bread of life is about the Eucharist, but there's more to it. That knowing Jesus, believing in Him, this is still, at least at the point in the discourse where it's talking about a spiritual relationship, something that happens that's about relating and belief and faith, that that is also life. And you could say, but there's a lot of people who are alive, like we use the word in English, that don't believe, that don't have faith. So you, you, do you start to feel the depth of the word? That there's something here that's more than just um, on the surface. And this is what we have to be careful of, because we hear bread of life, we jump to Eucharist. But this gospel is meant to be explored. This is like a vineyard with lots of grapes and you want to go picking. What does it mean to be alive? What does it mean to have life? When you start to touch that, when you start to ponder it, it's the same word that Jesus will use in the parable of the vine and the branches when we get to chapter 14, to be alive. It's a word that we've encountered before, and I think we've talked about how Greek has two different words. One, bios, biology, biological life, vegetable life, you know, the life of the tree, the life of grass, the life of someone who exists biologically as subject to biological processes. Does anyone remember our other Greek word for life? It's a good name. Sometimes women get it. Zoe, or Zoe. Zoe would be the English-sized thing, but ancient Greek, they would have said Zoe. Um, but Zoe is the word that means much more like life of the party or to truly live, that it's, it's something like that. So the Eucharist, the bread of life, is food for the body. It's a physical thing. You can eat it. It's also food for the soul. It nourishes our spirits. It's um, something that is also about believing in Christ, that to believe in Him is to touch the source and the fountain of life. Um, so it talks about hungering and thirsting and the wisdom and the law. This first image, it's pulling in a bunch of things that are actually from the Old Testament about the Scriptures. The feast of wisdom, the banquet of wisdom, to dine at the table of wisdom is a source of life to hunger and thirst for righteousness, to hunger and thirst for the commandments is a source of life. At this point in the discourse, that's actually the images that it's using. To do the will of the Father is a source of life. It's to have food. Jesus talked about that in chapter 4. I have food that you do not know of to do the will of the one who sent me. To be doing the will of God is something that nourishes our souls. I will not reject anyone who comes to me. Um, the word reject here is the same word that's used for throwing Adam and Eve out of the Garden of Eden. I will not throw away anyone who comes to me. Jesus is meant, Jesus desires to be the Savior of all, to be the Savior of all humanity. That He does not reject people who come to Him. And so, you run into this puzzle because it is a little bit like if Jesus doesn't reject those who come to him and people feel rejection, then where's the rejection coming from? So. Themselves. Yeah. No, that's not to say that there aren't emotional problems to work through and there aren't things to work through in a relationship with God. Amen, there are. We have lots of them. You will have struggles in your life. You probably have encountered 
plenty of them already. There's times where we ask questions. That's not what it's talking about. But it is important to remember, if we're allowing our hearts and our minds to be shaped by the scriptures, that Jesus rejects no one. I reject no one. What about when I sin and I feel like a pile of mud? Jesus rejects no one. What if you've been far away and haven't prayed in years? Jesus rejects no one. What if your feelings are all crazy? Yep, that one too. You see how it gives you an insight into his heart that Jesus is all love. So even on your deathbed, if you've been a schmuck all your life, he still won't reject you on your deathbed. He won't reject you on your deathbed. St. Faustina talks about it in the Revelations of Divine Mercy. The first saint is Dismas, the thief on the cross. Jesus says, today you will be with me in paradise. He's the first one. He was probably a murderer. I mean, crucifixion was a major penalty. He's the thief who stole heaven. That's one of the ways that he's described in history. So, but it's important because you see, there's times where our feelings go all backwards and our hearts are like, God doesn't love me and I try praying and nothing happens and I'm so rejected and he's so far away and you crash into verses like this and it's good just to crash. Just hit the wall, let it smack you in the face like Jesus rejects no one. Yeah, there is also, yep, there is also that peace. I will not reject anyone who comes to me, those who turn toward him. Yep, that is, you're on the right track. You see, I tell you, there's all kinds of things I don't know about the scriptures. You guys think that I know too much. Well, I keep trying to unconvince you of such things and I fail. Here's another one of these phrases. Everyone who sees the Son may have eternal life. There's that word life again, but think about this. What does it mean to see Jesus? What does it mean for him to gaze at you, to look into his eyes? What does it mean to hear his voice? Because to see him is to have eternal life. And this is odd, right? Because he's standing in front of people telling him this, telling them this. But they're not all going to have eternal life because not everyone's going to come to him. Some of them don't. Some of them grumble. Some of them turn away. And so you see how there's this juxtaposition, like he's physically standing in a spot in the synagogue in Capernaum when he's giving this discourse, and yet he says, to see me is to have eternal life. There's some of you who look with your eyes but do not see. Yes, yes, exactly. And I think like we've said before, this is one of the reasons why the scriptures are all for hard hats and shovels and you have to go digging. You know, like be very, very careful about taking words at face value. Dig into them. Think about what it means. Put it in its context because it's like, well, there's people who are seeing Jesus, but he says they're not. Why? Why would they say they see him but they don't. One of the best stories of this in the gospel is a blind man, Bartimaeus, in the city of Jericho, right? Who calls out, Jesus, son of David, have pity on me, and the disciples all get upset. Because he's blind, but he sees Jesus. And the people who are walking next to Jesus are actually blind. Like, you have all of these puzzles, this irony in the scriptures that's actually instructive. Because it reveals that like being blindness, in his case, is a gift. He actually has sight. And those who think they see and don't need a physician are the ones who are blind. But at this point in the discourse, it's still kind of working on this dynamic of belief and unbelief and faith. And it's like, we, we do have to be careful about moving past that so quickly because there's a truth here that belief is this dividing line and we want to, 
work at believing in Jesus. As much as we receive the scriptures, as much as we open our hearts to them, as much as we want to encounter God in the Eucharist, and amen, we do. Don't let go of that. But Jesus is using the same images about belief and about scripture. And we have to remember that. That Eucharist is the source and the fountain of life, is the bread of life, and so is scripture. And so is believing in God. It's how the discourse is structured. And it's good for us because we don't always think of the scriptures that way. Um, okay. The murmuring Jews. We mentioned like the Jews wandering in the desert. And then Jesus kind of, I think he pokes them here. And this is kind of funny. He says, how can you be upset with me for claiming God as my father when the scriptures say they shall be taught by God? It says it in your Bible. What do you think? I just, I have to imagine that sometimes he smiles. And he says that the Father draws them, that God is at work, the Holy Spirit is at work. Some of the great stories of this, if you haven't read them recently, I would encourage you, read about the Muslim world and Christian missionaries in the Muslim world. Read about it. The stories are bananas. Like people who have Jesus physically appear to them and walk into their room when they're devout Muslims. And then they end up in this really bizarre thing and they find a missionary and they encounter the scriptures and they look and they're like, this is the guy who I saw in my dream. He came to me. It is wonderful for us. It is encouraging to know that God is at work in the hearts of those who are seeking the truth. And there's story after story after story. There's millions of them. It's a lot of fun. Um, one of the good books for this is called Light Force by Brother Andrew, I think. He was a guy who founded an organization called Open Doors that used to go behind the Iron Curtain of the Communists and smuggle Bibles in. They transitioned their ministry to work more toward outreach to Muslims. Um, so I think it's called Light Force. Say the first word again. Light Force? Light. L-I-G-H-T. Light Force. This is, you want another bizarre story of grace. Um, I bought this book in 2003. And it sat on my shelf until 2014 when I read it. Eleven years later. And it came at like the perfect time. It's a great book. Um, another one is called Wind in the House of Islam. Um, that one is probably the best summary of where the church is in Muslim countries. And they have stories. They give you some statistics. They talk about the level of persecution. But it's amazing to read stories about how God is at work in places that are really, really bananas. And all kinds of funny things, right? Like stories, um, you know... Egypt won't let people who convert out of Islam change like their driver's license or their official religion from Muslims, right? And it sounds really tragic. But it also means that these people can go to Mecca for the Hajj where all the Muslims go and they can get in because their driver's license says they're Muslim. And so they're having like Bible studies in Mecca where like Christians aren't even allowed. And it's because of this government stupidity that won't let them change their driver's license to say that they're actually Christians. There's great stories out there, and they encourage us. Um, it's also really sad. I mean, some of it's also like, yep, they became a Christian. Their brother came up one night and cut off their head and killed them, and their family celebrated it. That happens in the Muslim world, too. Um, okay, then Jesus has a new phrase in the next part of the thing. I am the living bread that comes down from heaven. Well, wait a minute. Again, this is like, well, he was bread. I am the bread of life. And now he's saying, I am the living bread. What's the difference between living bread and other bread? <laughs> you see how, again, like this gospel is made to go exploring. And that this theme of life... <laughs> This theme of life 
is something that we come back to again and again. And this is a transition. So around verse 48 is where it transitions from the spiritual image and believing in Jesus and scriptures and the banquet of wisdom to the Eucharist and flesh and blood. He says, you must eat my flesh and drink my blood to have life. Now, this is going to offend Jewish people because blood was sacred to God. Eve, in Judaism, when the animals are ritually slaughtered, one of the big deals is you have to drain all of the blood out. In the temple, it was poured at the base of the altar. And Jesus says, you must drink my blood. And so it's sort of like, wait a minute, that's breaking all the rules. God told us not to do that. Why is this different? But Jesus is using, does anyone, did anyone pick up on the connection or remember what I said earlier, where this comes from? The flesh and blood from somewhere in the Old Testament that's really important, and we've talked about a ton. From Passover, the Paschal Lamb, whose blood you put on the doorposts and whose flesh you must eat. The Gospel of John uses the same word for eating that it uses in the Old Testament when it talks about eating the Paschal Lamb. It's the same word. It's the same concept. It's a very physical image. It means like to gnaw on a bone like a dog does. Now here, something is really interesting because Jesus says something that sounds kind of bizarre. You must eat my flesh and drink my blood. And how do the Jewish people who are listening to him understand him? Literally. They say, how can this man give us his flesh to eat? He's a man, he's over there, I'm not taking a bite out of you, Jesus, sorry. <laughs> right? Like, that would actually scare us. I'm not sure how ready I would be to receive the Eucharist if it was like you had to walk up and take a bite out of someone. It probably would not work in my brain very well. Right? But the Jews understand him literally. And that's important to the story they get the answer right. Like, this is what he means. And in this case, he won't back down. But he says, if you do not eat my flesh and drink my blood, you do not have life within you. Again, think about what that means. Think about the impact of those words in our lives, in the lives of people in our world, that something about Holy Communion is sharing in the life of God himself. Faith and scripture bring life. I'm always, for some reason, I in the argument, not arguments, but discussions with Southern Baptists. Where do you make the connection? That I think it depends on how they ask it. Like if faith and scripture and these kind of things, believing in Jesus bring life, then why do you need the physical presence of Christ as well that it's talking about at the end of the discourse. Um, I think if someone's being really genuine, the question is a lot better than it sounds at first. Because it's like, if I can find life here and here, why do I need this? And the best answer that I can give is because Jesus seems to think so because it's how he ends his discourse. You know, that there's reasons why we have the Eucharist. I think because you get this multi-layered connection. The Eucharist is real food. It feeds our bodies. It's also an image of the grace of God that feeds our souls. That the Eucharist really contains it. It's a real presence. But it's like there's a physical presence and a spiritual presence and you get both. There's something that's very human about that. You can say, I love someone all you want, but one of the best ways to show love is to give them a big hug and squeeze them. Sometimes I tell parents that, that sometimes the best discipline you can give your kid when they're misbehaving is to walk up and give them a long, awkward hug and just not let go. Let them know that you love them because something about the physical demonstration and encounter with love makes it more real.
must be received. Mm -hmm. So to say I don't need that is rejecting the greatest gift that he that he's given. That's a question I have. That there's yeah, that that there is something to be received as well. But it's a kind of question that personally I would be really careful with because if someone is genuinely seeking the truth, it's a really good question. Because it's, there's something about it where they're starting to wonder and they're starting to stretch past um, just believing in Jesus itself. And that's probably a sign that there is something more going on. You know, if you get a kind of a grouchy person who sort of throws the question in your face and is being arrogant about it, then I think you can walk through this discourse and look at it and say, like, no, this is what Jesus is talking about. But... For instance, so one of my friends, who's the Protestant pastor, he lives in northern Iraq outside of Erbil, and he's a missionary. Um, I encountered him when I was a focus missionary in Mankato. He's from an evangelical Protestant church um, that's very charismatic, and he thought that I was going to be his conversion project. I'm kind of a tough convert. Um, and there was a lot that he rejected that I said at that point. A few years ago, we got back in touch and now we email each other and he'll say, like, he's much more genuine now and he'll say things. He's still a Protestant, but really wondering what kind of direction to go. And he'll say things like, remember me when you celebrate the Mass. And it's like, hmm. <coughs> you know? So I think you do have to be careful because there's been grace at work in his life that is beyond and so he's the kind of person when he when people ask that question and it's genuine you know i think jesus would say come and follow me like you don't have to get all the way to the eucharist right away but you're on the right path just come along you'll get there um the bread those who eat the bread of life will live forever remember the jewish image of the garden of eden is that there's two trees a tree of knowledge of good and evil and a tree of life if you eat from the tree of life, you live forever. And if you eat from the tree of knowledge, you die. Because we're not made to have that kind of knowledge. But here, it links the same image to the Eucharist. That the Eucharist, holy communion with God, is like returning to the tree of life. And leaving behind the tree of knowledge of good and evil. That what Jesus is doing is this restoration, is this drawing back to the original state of humanity in the Garden of Eden. But it's even more, because even Adam in the Garden of Eden did not have God as his father the way that we do. That's changed, that's new, that was revealed in Jesus much later. Adam knew God better in some sense than we do, but also worse, because he didn't have the Holy Spirit in the same way. But the Eucharist as the bread of life is also like a new tree of life. It harkens all the way back to the garden. Uses this loaded phrase, remain in me. The indwelling of the Father and the Son is the same word. Like the unity of God as Father and Son from eternity is what Jesus says about remaining in him for those who eat his flesh and drink his blood. He talks about it as a living flesh that it's not a dead animal, it's not the sacrificial system. We've talked about this before too, how there's this critique of Judaism in this gospel, and this is one of the pieces that has changed. There's no more temple, there's no more animal sacrifices, because those are dead. You're offering God something that is dead. This bread, this sacrifice, this encounter, the Eucharist is living flesh. So then there's this rebellion among the followers of Jesus. Many have a hard time with it. These are hard words. They're not easy to wrap your mind around. Remember that, remember that, remember that. Because there are people out there who are genuinely seeking the truth, like this Protestant friend of mine. Um, you know, he's not Catholic yet, but he's on the right track. He's a good man. He's a holy man. You know, he's living with his family in a place where he could be shot and killed rather easily. Um, he, is, he believes in the gospel in a way that is profound and important. 
So be careful with that because when we talk to Protestants, when you get into discussions now, um, I don't debate with people anymore. I won't debate. If you want to throw scripture verses at me, I'd say no thank you. If you want to learn to read the Bible together and walk through a chapter like this, I would do that. I'd love to do that. I'd love to be, I want to sit down with Protestant pastors like crazy and ask them questions. Like, how do you understand this and how does it work? I'm convinced that they're going to get in trouble. <laughs> because I don't think you can read some of this stuff and stick in Protestantism very long. But be careful because these are hard teachings. And we have to remember that we've approached it often from a perspective of faith and been at it for so long that we've crossed lots of the hurdles. And for people on the outside, we want to encourage what is there to fan the flames, not to blow them out. You know, to walk with people and give them a push in the right direction instead of like pushing them down. Um, Jesus asked the 12 if they will leave too. Think about this. These are the 12 that he chose, the leaders of his entire group. And he says, he looks at them and he says, are you leaving too? Will you depart? I mean, again, think about how much that would break his heart. Would you walk up to 12 of your closest friends, your circle of 12, and say, you know, you have just revealed something deep in your heart? Maybe it's hard to understand. Maybe it's hard to believe. And to say, take it or leave it. I mean, this, is, this has to be a profound moment, a solemn moment. And it speaks to the conviction that Jesus is teaching with. That the Eucharist is worth losing the church over. Now, thankfully, Peter answers, Lord, to whom shall we go? Right? Like, there's another side to the story that Peter and the apostles have learned to trust in Jesus, to trust in his person, even if they're having a hard time struggling with his teaching. They probably are confused. They probably don't understand at this point. It seems very much like it. But they've learned to surrender to him as a person, that he has the words of eternal life, and so even though it doesn't make sense, they're going to stay with him because he gives them the meaning of life and they'll figure the rest out. And again, remember that because that's important. When you don't understand, sometimes when the church is teaching and it's hard, one of the saints I think talks about, or Fulton Sheen maybe, the democracy of the dead, that there's thousands and millions of people that have come before you that have believed these things and if all of their votes count as much as yours does, then you should believe them and not yourself. Some of the smartest people that have ever lived have tackled questions in theology. There's scholars today who would put Augustine, someone like Augustine, as being at least as brilliant as Albert Einstein, if not more. There's people who have tackled questions that most of us don't even ask. And they've been people of faith. So. It is important to remember that there are times where things are beyond us. There's times where it's like, Lord, I'm overwhelmed too much. Like, I'm just going to curl into a ball and I need to be held by you. That's okay. If you trust him, you're in the right place. All right. Let us pray. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Do we have at least a couple people signed up for next week? Okay, perfect. So then I will send it out. If there's still blanks, I'll leave those, and then you can send me something back and fill it in. Uh, next week, theoretically, Father Keller will get the notes done today or tomorrow, and it will happen, but... Um, I 